First mm. of all, how are you, Luke? Thank you for joining us. What's going on with you and uh, with your work? Um, yeah, so um, I'm good, thanks. Uh, there's a lot going on with work. Um, some stuff I can't announce, but um, you know, it will come out very soon. Um, Tell us the secrets. Yeah. I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah, it's coming soon. <laughs> we'll give you the, 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 the release when it comes out. Um, no, we've been good. We've been busy. Um, obviously, I, I guess you're alluding to you know what's been happening with AI and the pace at which things are, are moving forward, and and the implications of that for um, digital signage is, is is immense. I mean, in that piece, we touched on it, and we talked about AI being used to kind of control what was shown with feedback loops and stuff like that. And I, but I think the, you know, since uh, GPT is you know hit the, the the mainstream now the the possibilities for digital signage are, are, are immense really and there's a lot of low-hanging fruit um kind of like we're kind of exploring both ends there's stuff that's just obvious and will easily work and it, it really doesn't take very long to, to to hook up and then there's like you know stuff where it's like this completely changes the game but you kind of got to start again from a core of just ai um so we're kind of exploring both ends of that spectrum um now, as yeah. an expert in the space, maybe you can help me because there's so much hype. And of course, I'm staying mm -hmm. up late reading all these articles about, you know, the death of journalism or the death of fiction, mm -hmm. I'm a fiction writer, all these things. And I think there's a lot of negative hype, but there seems to be some really positive potential here, too. Can you speak to that a little bit? What is coming down the pike and are we living in the Star Trek days now? I think it's kind of coming very fast. We're on an exponential curve, right? Which it's a very hard thing for humans to understand. Our brains just don't really understand it. It's just like, we can say it, we can look at it, we can try to draw it, but we, we really just, yeah, we're about to live through another one. Um, I would say uh, for digital science specifically, what the biggest thing is understanding context. Context changes the game in kind of uh, spatial computing because if the screen and the application on the screen can understand who the user is, what they want, what they're doing, what their job is, where they are, what's happening with, you know, let's say the logistics of that environment, um, it can be so much more useful. Um, and so we can go from this, <clears throat> essentially just broadcasting out information, essentially, I mean, it's kind of moving beyond dumb, dumb screens into screens that, you know, you can just talk to, or they will um, be, able, and that's a different kind of application because up until now, operating systems have just been, uh, you know, point and click. We tap things with our. We we do all the control as humans. We do most of the work, right? Yeah. Um, whereas if the AI can understand the context of what the user's doing and what application they want and stuff like that, then it becomes more of a conversation, and that's very natural via voice, um, as long as the thing you're talking to understands <laughs> and isn't isn't like you know stupid. Um, so so I think we're kind of reaching that point where soon, uh, you know, interaction is going to get like the doors are going to be blown off at the potential of what we can do with screens um but yeah then there's also i mean that's just the I, i'm really excited about that kind of edge um sure. to it because i think it opens up a new kind of computing almost um but when we kind of pull it back to okay what else can we do with 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 this technology well you know there's uh content summarization taking like a pdf or a press release that's been released and then summarizing the content, turning it into content that would be fit for essentially a poster advertising something or, or that event or, you know, like or translating stuff from one language into another. That's a big deal for us because we work with a lot of deskless workers um, and they speak in various languages. So just being able to take existing feeds of content and say, on the fly, translate this into another language and, and you know, render it out, all, all of that. And then that's, an, I'm not even touched on like the UI layer. Basically the UI layer at some point is going to get replaced by AI generated interfaces um, in the same way that we've seen, kind of seen it with generative art and stuff, right? That's kind of um, pixel based, essentially starting with random noise and then slowly changing until we have this amazing graphic. Well, AI can do that with code and CSS and all of those component parts. And right now the AI is kind of blind. It's just generating code based on what it thinks, um, but it's not yet seeing what it's doing, if that makes sense. So once you close that feedback loop and the AI can see what it's generating, in the same way a developer kind of, you know, sent as a div is the uh, classic example of like, you mess around with CSS and say, okay, now it's centered, that's good. The AI can do the same thing. And then if you, you know, that's every one of that, like a click of the top, um, tick of a clock as it were, as it goes forward. So it will just, the generation will get better. Um, so yeah, so I can kind of see like big, big parts of the industry will change. Well, it's interesting you say that. Now, forgive me, I get so excited that I jump in, yeah. but it, it feels as if every time I test these new tools, and you know, I, 
spent a couple of weekends testing this uh, Dolly and all these different generative mm -hmm. AIs for art and things. Um, but there's not a self-corrective executive function, as it were, where it's saying, okay, but is this actually giving the outputs that I want? How do I tweak the outputs? Why is that missing? And I've heard people, when I talk to like experts in the space who are way smarter than me, they kind of blanch when I say artificial intelligence. They're like, no, 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 it's just mach machine learning. I think David mm -hmm. Yulene one time said, no, 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 it's minor birds. They're just minor birds. What's that all about? Uh, I mean, it is only predicting the next word or the next token, right? It is kind of that, it is a, it can, can hallucinate, it can be dumb, it can, it, it is all of that. But it's, what I found is that, and I think people miss somewhat when they just use, say, the chat interface or something like that, is is that it's about layering on context. And it's almost like you're you're giving the, um, giving the AI, guardrails or, or, or guidance as to, to what space you want it to play in. And then you give it a very specific task to do, and it can get very good at doing those small tasks. And if you then take those a system and decompose it into pieces and then have other bits that supervise other parts and, and et cetera. So you, you basically like, rather than have it try to let it do everything, like you can just tell it, write a book and it will, but it, it's much better to kind of break it down into small pieces and then um, yeah, have them run in isolation. And, yeah. So I guess the analogy might be, you know, we're trying to ask this poor thing to do all these outputs from coding to, as you say, creative stuff. But yeah. when, if I was a publisher and I was hiring someone to write a, a romance novel, mm -hmm. I want a brain that's been trained in this special set of data for 25 years and knows what people yeah. want. And that's the other and thing. Where in life life and everything else, right? It's like, yeah. it's like a baby that's just come out, hasn't opened its eyes yet. And we're going. Oh, look! It's you know, it can only do basic math, or or or, or you know, oh look! It's 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 sort of getting this wrong and stuff like that. Baby Terminator but, it grows up so fast. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like we're about to, you know, go for exponential teenage years at some point. Um, so just these additional capabilities that um, basically it treats everything as a token, right? So 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 words or, or music or anything we can turn into tokens, we can then feed into the system and it can then generate stuff. Um, so, so yeah, it's 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 kind of mind blowing where where that potential goes. I think it will re revolutionize software development for sure. Um, but I'm excited about screens because it's uh, it's like a new space. Like, it, well, I, I describe it like this: this is my mobile phone, right? It's my personal phone. This is my personal computer, right? In the 1980s, we we kind of split into a world of personal computing. And back then, some people were like worried that we'd end up in a world in which we we're all glued to our devices. You know, like it, the, the devices would suck us in. And it kind of did come to play, right? It just required a dopamine, dopamine loop and the internet, and suddenly we've got everyone glued to their phones. But they wanted a world in which computers kind of we were in the background, you know, they were there to help and they, they came up when they needed and they did stuff for us and they, they provided stuff, but they didn't demand our attention. They didn't suck us in. Um, so that kind of idea of like, what does the kind of pervasive computing or ubiquitous computing, how does that work? What does that look like? And then how does um, AI enable that? Um, I think it's really interesting, but it's also kind of greenfield space because we have interfaces, we have operating systems, we have apps, we have everything on our personal devices. But on these screens, it's still very nascent, right? It's very basic. Like when we show interactions, maybe it's like a QR code and you fill out a form, or you know, it, it's it's definitely not like a full normal computing experience. But I think every all the pieces are there. You know, we just need a web web rendering surface, connection to the internet, and a connection to the AI, and then it's got the inputs and outputs required to, yeah. To so do this that, is, this is basically the future is going to be. It sounds like the ultimate personalization across advertising, across screens, the single pane of glass that people have been seeking the holy grail, right? Yeah. And even in yeah. terms of this, is something that kind of drives me nuts. I love technology. I have since I could walk. I've been in love with computers, but it drives me batty. You've got a system that is tailored to eight billion people now. Well, that's not tailored. Mm -hmm. It's not personalized. What about the accessibility? What about my my unique quirks mm -hmm. and personalities? And it sounds like from what you're saying, we're getting to systems that can customize themselves for the user and also self-correct. Is that, is that fair to say? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're going to see a new breed in operating systems for sure. And they'll, they'll be, you know, the major tech companies will, will push forward in different ways. Um, and it's, it seems obvious that we're going to have some sort of agent that's our personal agent that's like the entry point to this, right? That's the race to become that agent. Um, 
I'd like to see that be more pluggable so people can kind of choose their agent and people can experiment with different ones and stuff like that. But whatever this kind of entity or, I mean, I don't really want to uh, anthropomorphize it, but like it's yeah, a thing we talk to, um, let's say, that, that we trust and is, is part of this operating system, that's going to need to output on screens. It's going to need to uh, interface with all the devices around you. So that's kind of like the bit where I'm focused is, is okay, we're probably not going to be building the, the core brain that you talk to, but let's let whatever that is that's coming, that will come from different angles from different companies, let's that re let it reach out and get to all the you know, potential web connected displays you know, in, your, in your business, in your, in your home, et cetera. So it can kind of, um, yeah, display wherever it needs to display. It's it's so hard because in our industry it's like it's becoming less siloed, but it feels like there's hardware folks and then there's software folks and then there's martech folks and there's different. How do folks in our industry prepare, get ahead of, thrive in this almost black box future that we're heading into? And I don't want you to give away you know secrets, but in yeah. general terms, what can folks start doing to prepare? Um, okay, that's an interesting question. I was thinking about this actually earlier, and I, I think the things, I mean, a lot of the things we're doing are not like, you know, super cutting edge and pushing on the, like we're in experimental AI stuff, but there's a lot we're doing that's just like stuff that has to get done. And a lot of that is connecting up different business systems, you know, ensuring that you have access to the data to operate on. Because we're soon going to have systems and things that can operate on this data and, and extract meaningful stuff out of it and process it and do all wonderful things. But like just getting ready to be able to make sure that the data is in an accessible format or the data is available and you've got APIs and stuff like that, that can take quite a while. So, so I think that kind of preparation. So if you're a business and you've got business systems or whatever and you, you're, you're preparing this, I would be looking to ensure that you, you make sure you've got access to all the, all the various bits of data that you, you want a system um, that you know, is intelligent and can access that data to, to have access to. Is this is this change as big as I heard someone say the other day, you know, this is like when the Internet first became a consumer product and people mm -hmm. were like, this is going to be big. Do you feel like this is similar? Yeah, I do. Uh, I, I think I mean, I've been what, over 20 years in tech um, and I don't think I've seen a moment quite like this. I, I, I live through the Internet starting, but it wasn't, um, you know, the consumer Internet, but it didn't seem to happen like overnight it got going around 2000 right and it's like getting hyped up and stuff like that but it was going for quite a few years before that slowly growing this feels like you know matter of months and and weeks everything's just moving so fast and uh with the capabilities and the obvious trajectory it'll unlock many more things so we can now imagine things that were not possible before or seemed not like they, they were distant they now seem quite possible is just a matter of people putting the pieces together, right? And that, that process will accelerate and, and so on. So I think we're in for a bit of a wild ride and just, I'm sure you've experienced it recently, the number of products getting launched. And, and it's kind of like, I think right now, there's a lot of people adding AI to products where it's like low hanging fruit. It's obvious, right? Like um, I was having a discussion today about translations for websites and, you know, maybe Prismic would have uh, an AI feature to, to translate content in there. The website and so on, it seems an obvious thing for them to add. But I think, uh, you know, give it a little bit more time and we'll get much more sophisticated systems coming on online. It's, you know, developers haven't had that long to, to kind of really build on this stuff yet. One of the other changes uh, that I've seen is I hear so much about Google Chrome and it seems mm -hmm. like Google is trying to move into the silent space in a way I haven't necessarily seen before. Is mm -hmm. Google becoming one of the major players and, and what do we need to watch for here? Because you just recently announced some news about Google. Yeah, we've uh, on their Chrome um, Enterprise Recommended program now uh, as approved um, partner, which is which is wonderful. And we've worked with Google for many years, so uh, it's nice to kind of um, you know finally have a partnership there and and um, have access um, to to experts and and just that you know level of um, uh, help and support really. Um, but no, um, so well, more about that though, because I'm curious because when you say access to experts, it's a very interesting. We did a little press release uh, mm -hmm. news item about it. But what exactly does this new certification mean for you guys? And should other people be looking at, hey, we should get this too? 
Uh, yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, you, there's there's two sides to it. There's a there's a more business side of it where you, you work with Google sales team and, and so on, kind of on opportunities and, and that side of things, which is obviously wonderful for a business to unlock that, and we're excited for the potential there. But on the engineering side, there's kind of a, a greater degree of access to the you know the Chrome digital signage team, and then also just the Chrome team themselves. So, um, you know, and that's useful for us with Chrome OS. Uh, and it's useful for us on other platforms as well. Whenever we can actually talk to the developers working on the, the core bits of technology, we can kind of put forward our viewpoint um, or ask for certain features or just kind of like tell them how we feel about how where things are going. When, when I think about Google in the digital signage space, um, I mean, there's a kind of history there, right? They, they, they've kind of gone a little bit hot and cold over, over the years. Um, I hope I won't be in trouble for saying that but like there was a time when they kind of rushed in and, and then they kind of went a little bit more cold and then now they're kind of coming back um and i think it makes sense because um just that you know digital signage or screens and spaces connected screens um are it's a new kind of computing device uh it sort of sees them differently than they're not like laptops and stuff like that so while a company might have a policy that they use you know windows on all of their laptops for instance um they would accept having Chrome OS on their digital signage or or some other area, if you see what I mean. So it's an entry point. It's a it's an entry point into those organisations um, to kind of show how show show the the power of Chrome OS and the benefits, which is you know security, uh, centralised management. Um, there's a, there's a lot that Chrome OS has been built from the ground up to be a kind of web uh, operating system with a with a really strong security model. Um, so that works really well for digital signage, but then I, I think, you know, companies would then say, okay, well, actually, maybe this works for, you know, frontline workers as well, or uh, maybe we can use it for some, you know, tablets or kiosks over here, et cetera. So it kind of, um, I, see, I see Google sees the opportunity, basically, um, for, for, for that space. Um, and, and for folks who don't know the Chrome OS, would, would it be fair to say this is kind of like a, a lightweight, robust uh, system, kind of like a Linux, Ubuntu, Red Hat, you know? Yeah, so it's actually, I, I believe the, the core is kind of Linux based. Um, uh, I imagine it will, I mean, I would be speculating, but I imagine Google has another uh, generation of operating system to come. Uh, I think there's Fuchsia and, and some other ones, but like there's probably like a, uh, a path forward on the roadmap of what happens with Chrome OS, but uh, currently at least it's, it's Linux based. Um, and then essentially it boots into an operating system, which is uh, running you know, instances of Chrome where, where Chrome kind of represents the applications within the operating system. In fact, I think if you, if you zoom out, what we're seeing, we probably started in the nineties with the launches of like, you know, web browsers and so on up until now is the web browser becoming the operating system. Essentially, so you, you know you've got uh, you've got the ability to run assembly code. You've got you've got the ability to access the GPU now, and and as Chrome has pushed with Chrome OS, they've added more and more platform capabilities. Initially, they added them uh, as kind of um, specialized things only on Chrome OS for Chrome packaged apps, um, but they've they've kind of pivoted away from that and said, okay, well we're going to rip all that custom stuff out because this is the, the platform is the web, um, and we're going to kind of build in the APIs uh, necessary for, to kind of have access to platform level stuff in a safe way. So in a sandbox way or whatever, that's, a, that's an interesting challenge because digital signage, we, you know, we often need access to things at a fairly low level, or we need to be able to, you know, keep the device awake and like, there's lots of access, you know, full file system access, all sorts of things. Um, so, so digital signage is quite a challenging application for, for, for a full web base with no support on any of the other parts application, but Chrome OS is the leading edge of um, making that happen, I'd say. And with all of these variables, and you talk about some of these, mm -hmm. I guess, root access and so forth, and I'm thinking of our, our friends in Europe who had to have suddenly, were powering down overnight to save power because of the new regulation. Mm -hmm. How do you factor in cybersecurity with all of that? And that's kind of, it's weird. I don't hear enough people talking about security these days. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, Chrome OS has a good security uh, posture. It starts with uh, like a uh, trusted platform module uh, at, at the core. So, so then it's got secure boot and, and everything and, and a provable identity, et cetera. Um, also the operating system itself is, is, is mostly read only. Um, so, so there's a, you know, it, to, to basically 
route a, a Chromebook, it requires a hell of a lot of steps you have to go through in order to get the file system writable, et cetera, et cetera. So, so Google have kind of started with a security first or security by default approach um, with Chrome OS, whereas other operating system, you're kind of locking down things um, after the fact because it's starting starting with it being a user operating system, operating system which they're, they're going to do stuff, whereas Chrome OS you know, in kiosk mode or something, it's not even got to that level. Do you do you see uh, the future changing from a Eurocentric and North America centric digital signage industry where it becomes this global force? And also, what's the local signage market like? What kind of things do you see happening? To answer your first way, I've been here about twenty years. Two thousand and four, I, I came to Thailand, um, but we started uh, Screen Cloud in uh, twenty fifteen. Um, actually, out, out of Thailand as well. We had an office in UK and office in Thailand. Um, so we've always we've always been here. And we've always been a global company. Um, as for how I see the the shift, um, I don't know. For me, I guess it's always been here. There's a lot of digital signage in in Asia. You know, like they they like putting up big screens and um, but it's predominantly advertising based. I don't see um, um, you know kind of um, you know that much interactive stuff, and I don't see that much uh, you know kind of operational stuff to to be honest uh, it's mostly advertising side run by uh you know large advertising companies um from from what i see um but there's an awful lot more screens around and they, they've just the cost of them has come down so much that that there's a proliferation of of them mm -hmm. well i mean it, it has it's, i mean screens i mean when we started screen cloud we kind of made two bets one was that screens were going to keep getting bigger and cheaper and the other one was that the these uh, little stick things that we saw you know the start of the kind of uh, small computers you could plug into tvs that was going to continue and get faster better and eventually that tech would be uh you know basically plugging a mobile phone brain into a screen um and both of those things came to play so so yeah i think the the trend is is obvious like you know look at oled screens and they're, they're, they're super thin and, and the price of them has come down so so much um so so yeah just the excessive like what's a, what's a television cost in thailand you can probably buy a 55 inch television for like 250 bucks or something like that and it, like it's 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 dirt cheap so um yeah it's 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 readily available but people are not yet getting the full potential out of it you know they might put a screen up they might put some stuff on the screen a signage but that screen could be doing so much more um that's my, my feeling it's like a kind of latent uh, potential to, to to basically bring these screens alive they're everywhere they've already got computers plugged into them they might already be connected to the internet but we're not yet really utilizing them um so it's such an amazing thing because most technology you've got this uh, adoption curve right where the deployment of that technology has to happen over a period of time and it's really expensive and uh, then the price comes down over time in this case well it's already deployed it's already cheap it's just a matter of like the things needed to kind of connect it up and, and the use cases and the, the reasons to use it and all, all that things kind of come alive. Um, well, yeah, so. that also plays into what you had told us, you know, content is king. You kind of really mm -hmm. hammered into that. Like you've yeah. got to remember your content. How are you touching people with your site? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Content's king. Knowing uh, what, you know, what your data is, where your content's coming from. Now that stuff, if you've got, if you've basically got the data, if you've got a lake of content, you can pull it out, summarize it, reformat it in some way, decide what's important, rewrite it, translate it, push it out as needed in the right places. So the question becomes, okay, do you have access to your content and do you have a strategy that works for your business? And every business is different, right? There's different shapes, different, uh, you know, maps of how they run their businesses. Some are, you know, we work a lot with like deskless workers and, and uh, manufacturing and that sort of thing big spaces with people walking around. And so, so when they, they, they typically start off with showing information, like, like, you know, basically, uh, you know, useful information, maybe it's health and safety or some other company information. But then once they see that these screens are live and can be updated and we can change the information sent to every screen, it starts to become operational and they start to want dashboards or they start to want, uh, you know, custom applications that help them in that location. Um, and that's the kind of, um, maturity model we see. With, with with screens, you know, once we have customers started on that journey and they, they're kind of bought into the idea screens are good, we want to be using them to, to kind of inform. And then we show them, okay, it can do more. And I get the sense talking to you, you're very passionate. I love your energy. You seem to really enjoy and love what you do. What makes you smile about your daily work? Because it seems like you really enjoy this. Um, I like 
creation. That's why I do this. I like to take an idea, flesh it out, think it through, and then uh, go through the, the, the toil and effort and blood, sweat and tears in order to see it come alive. And I love those moments where you first start to see the potential of the thing, you know, and I, I can ignore all the, you know, the, the, the duct tape here or the other things, but okay, we can see it. it, it, it that's that's what we're going for. That that feeling of of like, yeah, just thinking something up, inventing it, and then creating it is 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 why I do what I do. Um, there's often a lot else to the job <laughs> as well. <But> like <laughs> the creation part is what um, is what keeps me keeps me going. Yeah. Is is there anything else, any other burning thoughts you'd like to uh, say into the microphone for the industry? Do this, don't do this, et cetera. I think let's not miss this opportunity as an industry, right? We basically have this computing platform deployed, right? And we've got the tech now to really uh, bring it alive and get it to do really useful things for people. It's not going to be one company alone making that happen, right? It's going to require bunch of us in digital signage kind of working together and coming up with maybe making things more interoperable. Uh, there's basically a lot of work to be done. And in order to, to do a good job of this, uh, as companies in the space, I think we need to kind of collaborate and, and move beyond kind of the basics of digital signage. Uh, there's an opportunity there for us.